think. And without further ado, welcome, Alan. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. It's uh, really good to, to be here. Just let me know if I uh, can't hear very good online, um, and I'll speak up or fix whatever. But that's right. I am not noble. Noble is the much smarter guy in the room. Um, <laughs> I'm the fill-in or the understudy or the backup, whatever you want to say, fourth string. I, I don't know. But um, I was scheduled to give this talk on the 2nd of February, so it was sort of in the works anyway. So I'm glad to be here today with all of you. Um, I want to acknowledge this really very little of what I'm going to present today is actually my work. Um, we're going to go through a little bit of history of size limits of Pacific halibut at the IPHC. Um, and so I really have to acknowledge the co-authors on this talk in a paper that's in prep. Ian Stewart, he's in the room. Uh, Basha Hucknicksack and Dave Wilson, both IPHC staff. Um, they are working on this stuff with me, but you'll see as we go through this, there's a whole history of people involved in um, Pacific halibut research. So, Okay, so IPHC, the International Pacific Halibut Commission, is 100 years old. We're celebrating our 100th year, which is pretty pretty remarkable. Um, the convention that started IPHC began uh, was signed in 1923, but then you know at that time things weren't that fast, so it wasn't until it was proclaimed on the 22nd of October in 1924, um, and it's been updated a few times, but the most recent is a 1990. 1979 uh, protocol that really defines a lot of the management stuff that we do at IPHC. <clears throat> it's really, um, IPHC is really known as the first international agreement for joint management of a green fishery, and that was an agreement between Canada and the U.S. Um, and what's really interesting is the convention is named for the preservation of the halibut fishery of the Northern Pacific Ocean and Bering Sea. And it was actually um, inspired, or it was a, um, the stakeholders pursued this to happen in the early 1920s. Um, and so what I'd like to always find interesting is the convention states the preservation of the halibut fishery, not necessarily the halibut stock. Preserving the halibut fishery does mean you're going to have to preserve the stock in my case. Um, other notable things are uh, one of the first USA commissioners was Miller Freeman. There's a NOAA boat named after him, or was, I guess, he's retired now. Um, and the first executive director, if you ever have a chance to talk to Bill Clark, he knows a lot of history about William Thompson, uh, <clears throat> and ask him about the desk that Bill Clark sat at here at the University of Washington. Um, William Thompson was also the director of the, the School of Fisheries, or was it then? Yes, the School of Fisheries at the same time, he was the director at IPHC. So a lot of really cool history. Um, and in fact, when you walk down the hallways of the IPHC offices, we have a nice display with um, some posters of different decades and eras of the 100 years of IPHC. And so I took a snapshot or took a picture of a couple of posters and some interesting things. You see here this poster from the 1920s, set line surveys and tagging studies began. I think there's also a line there, start of hydrographic measurements, you know, in 1927. So there's a really, really good history of data collected on Pacific halibut and um, the Northeast Pacific Ocean in general. And so then you keep walking down that hallway, lots of cool pictures, but in the 2000s, you see things, 2002, IPHC begins um, more tagging studies. So lots of tagging studies, but these are, again, now much more advanced tags, these satellite tags. Um, and to look at migration control halibut. Now, we've been doing this work, and fortunately, I guess, maybe for us, halibut are very complex in their life history, so we have a lot more work to do. We have 100 years of data collected in certain areas, but we're still learning, and there's a lot more work to do, so we're always looking to collaborate, with, um, especially with students. Okay, so we're going to walk through a little bit of more history on specifically on size limits, but a little bit of background on IPHC and halibut. This is the, the convention area that um, is our basically our jurisdiction for management of Pacific halibut, ranging from actually Central California all the way around to. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. 
But you're standing on yours. Yeah. Because it's switching slides. Chris, I can see it too. Oh, maybe I'll, I'll sort it out with this. So. Maybe it's. Um, there, is there anybody online that is unable to see my screen besides, um, I think, what about? Because maybe it's just the panelist thing. Well, I'll continue on if that's all right. And um, it just yeah. doesn't seem to be much. No. Um, so anyways, this is our convention area, um, quite quite a large area, and um, we have it divided into different um, IPHC regulatory areas. So there's eight different IPHC regulatory areas where the Bering Sea is really considered one regulatory area, but domestic management splits it out into 4C, 4D, 4E. <clears throat> we manage this species or this as a single coastwide stock. So we consider it as one spawning population, and we've identified four biological regions, which are important for spatial conservation. Um, and oh, I have those. I think I took them off the slide, but there, um, there, there's four biological regions, basically similar to the the numbers of each regulatory area: four, four B, three, and two. And there seem to be some slight differences between those regions. So we consider that in our management as well. Pacific halibut. Uh, Pacific halibut, they range over this entire convention area, but they also go into um, Korea and even northern Japan. So they range quite a large, um, they have a large range over the North Pacific Ocean, and they can live up to like 50 years. They can grow greater than 500 pounds. I'm sure you've seen pictures or stories about barn doors. Um, they, get, they can get pretty big. Um, they've been observed to migrate very long distances from the Bering Sea into the Puget Sound here, for example, not one year, but over many years. Um, and there's highly variable weighted age across these years, or the size of age really, meaning they, they change size over time, up and down actually, not unidirectional. And there's dimorphic growth between the two sexes. And just to point out that Bill Clark there, standing next to a halibut larger than him, um, and this is a picture I took on a survey of two halibut caught right close to each other on the stage showing very different patterns. So everything about halibut is variable and complex. So that, that brings a lot of um, interesting analyses in. So this is an example of uh, changes in weighted age in the female Pacific halibut over the last almost 100 years. And each colored line is a different age group, and then it shows the average body weight um, collected from all our data sources um, shown over time. And really what you'll see that stands out here is in the late 70s or early 80s, halibut were growing large. They were, they were getting big. Ian and I saw some historic video just the other month, and it was <clears throat> videos of them just pulling in the long line onto the boat in this time period, and it was just amazing. Every fish was big compared to now. They were much bigger than they are now, as you can see at the end of this plot. Average body size is much less, and an age 16 fish could have been three times as large on average, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So this is an important dynamic to consider, and I'll be discussing this a lot in this talk today. When you plot the length at age, I, 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 I don't know. I, I, <laughs> Ian, I didn't believe Ian Stewart the first time he told me length is so variable and so doesn't have a, a, a relationship. And so I said, I got to see this for myself. So I plotted it. And I'm like, holy cow. There's no von Bertalampia that really fit that. And in fact, I was reading through some historic documents and they, they often made the assumption of this linear growth in Pacific Halibut. And, and that's probably a good assumption, you know, up to age 25 or so for females, maybe, maybe all the ages. Who can imagine how big a female could get if it lived to 100? But you notice that not only is there not really a pattern in growth, but growth is highly variable. The length is variable. You can have a female that's 30 years old that's less than 100 centimeters or greater than 200 centimeters. So tons of variability, and males don't grow as large as females. Another important consideration. Yeah. 
Can you go back to the slide, please? <laughs> That's across all the years that you're going to be there. Um, I didn't make this plot, but I'll show you one coming up that'll show the difference between years. But um, what I did when I made this plot coming up, I said, you know what, let me see if I can rephrase this plot. And I plotted it across all years and I plotted it within a year and there wasn't much difference in the vari variation. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty amazing. The variability was the same, but the average would change. And I'll show you the average in another plot that will help you explain. But it's amazing, that variability is still there. So good question, thanks. Um, so the fisheries. So there's a, there's many different fisheries for Pacific halibut, directed commercial. It goes out with long lines. There's recreational rod and reel. It's a lot of fun. Um, subsistence, subsistence and ceremonial fishing. It's important species, important food source for uh, Native Americans and uh, First Nations. And then there's the non-directed commercial fisheries, which actually, actually have to release all the fish at sea. Halibut are pretty tough. Many of them do survive even after trawling. Um, but some do die after um, being caught and released, and that's called discard mortality. So I want to point out that right now the directed commercial fisheries has a size limit. So they have to release all fish under 32 inches or 81.3 centimeters. Um, those have to be discarded at sea. And we assume that 16% of this, those discards of those what we'll called U32 or under 32 inch fish uh, are, suffer mortality when after discard. So here's a plot, maybe Paul, that'll help you looking again at length at age with that size limit now um, in the back of your mind, that 81.3 centimeter or 32 inch size limit. What I've plotted here are the um, <clears throat> average length at age. So this is just taking the average and for each of the years between 1998 and 2021. And these are observations from our, um, our fishery independent set line survey of this. Females on top, males on the bottom. And I, you can see one thing that there's definitely been a decrease from 1998 to 2021 here um, in the average length at age, um, a slight decrease. But that's really important because that horizontal line there is the size limit. And so you can see, especially for males, and I'm here, I should point this. Yeah. Um, especially for males, that you know, in 1998, a male that was about 12 on, on average would have been a 32 inch male. But nowadays that male, same male um, at age 15 would be entering on average into the size limit or into being able to be landed. So that's that's a big difference. There's a lot of years there that, um, that sort of matter. So we wanna consider that in our investigation size. So to put that in perspective of this changes over this whole period in the size and age, um, you'll see a plot like this on many slides to give you a perspective of where we're looking at when I describe the history of this. And so this plot here is that white area, and it's only looking at this period where if we looked from 1970s, that there was even a larger decline in the size of age. Um, so that variability can have pretty big consequences. Okay, so let's uh, let's go through a little bit of history of size limits for Pacific halibut. In 1928, the first report of IPHC, um, there was a statement that expressed concern about the excessive capture of small halibut. Um, and it wasn't until 1940 that they actually introduced the size limit. And that size limit was a, a size limit on weight. So it was a five pound limit. They couldn't land a fish under five pounds dressed without its guts and gills. Um, in 1944, they converted that to inches um, to make it easier to comply with. But actually it's amazing how well these fishermen can uh, identify the weight of a fish and even the size of the fish. When it's coming up on the rail, they don't even really measure too many of them. They just pop them off and, and release them. They're so good at doing that. And the reason it was a, a pound limit back then was they had categories uh, for prices at the dock when they landed them, zero to five, five to 10, and things like that. And the other funny thing is they call anything under a five pound, you know, they call them juveniles or babies, they call them babies, and then five to 10 was like chickens or something back then. So they put in this uh, size limit in 1944, 26 inches, 
But there was concern throughout the 70s of this uh, increase in the size at age. Um, and they also noticed that it was declining in the discards, the amount of fish they had to throw over because the fish were growing faster, getting larger for age, and thus they weren't having to discard as much. So they actually noticed um, this effect. And just to note to convert for you, 66 centimeters is 26 centimeters. We have to do that a lot at IPHC. I'm sure you'll learn that later. <laughs> um, so it wasn't until 1960 that they're all, hey, we got some really new tools. We read Beverton and Holt. Let's do some yield isopleth diagrams and check this out. Um, age of entry, all this fun stuff, instantaneous rates of fishing mortality. Um, and let's figure out, are we optimally managing Pacific halibut with this size limit? And so to give you a little bit of background, at this time, an age seven fish was about four to 10 pounds. An age 10 fish was 83 to 101 centimeters. So an age 10 fish would have been legal. I, I don't know if this was males or females um, in those numbers though, um, but um, what they ended up concluding by creating a lot of plots like this, this is one example from their report, is that, um, that the current management is near the optimum. And that's what the key is, is present management, uh, instantaneous rate of fishing against the age of entry. Um, given that size limit, that was their assumptions. And they figured, you know what, we're pretty close in area three, we'd have to increase F a lot to get a small amount of increase in yield. So they didn't change the size limit at that time. And you can see they were operating when the stock was increasing in size of age. So in 1973, another analysis was done and now they're starting to approach the peak. So they're in a very different time than 1940s um, when they first set the size limit. And, and at this point in time, an age five fish was 62 and an age seven fish was about 84 centimeters. Uh, and so a little bit different than 1960, and they investigated um, three assumptions about this carbon mortality rate. So they started thinking here about our size limits appropriate for how big the fish are getting, but let's think about discard mortality rates as well. And a discard mortality rate is the assumption of what percentage of fish die after being released, what percentage of those small fish die after being released. So they would create plots like this, and what you'd notice is it makes quite a difference um, what your assumption about how many fish die afterwards and the, and the amount of fishing mortality um, makes a big difference on your outcome of what the appropriate size limit or age of entry, as they called it back then, is. So they created more isopleth diagrams, and you see they're getting a little bit fancier here. I don't, I'm, I'm curious how they created this plot, but it's pretty cool. Um, and what they found was the 32 inch size limit now, remember it's 26 at this time, they found a 32 inch size limit eliminates most of the catch of chicken halibut, which are usually under eight years old. And, um, and that larger size limit was expected to increase the yield. So they actually changed the size limit to 32 inches. And since 1974, I think it was, that 32 inch size limit has remained. It was actually 1973. They did another analysis in 74. But that 32 inch size limit has remained since then. But that's been constant. The uh, number of analyses has been increasing for sure. But it wasn't until 1995 when Bill Clark and Anna Parma decided to look at this again. And you probably understand why, because now we're on this declining average size of age. Um, and what, what they used were more equilibrium methods, like yield per recruit curves, and, um, and they looked at some scenarios. They thought about scenarios. Okay, the size limit 32 inches has been in forever. What happens if we remove the size limit or lower the size limit? Will the fishery try to stay focused on large fish, or will they start to target smaller fish? Will selectivity change? So they wanted to run different scenarios with different selectivity shifts. What they found, and you see the status quo is the dot there, and they were about near the peak of this uh, fishing mortality and size limit, which is reverse of the other plot that I showed you. But they found that the 32 inch minimum size limit was appropriate again. And, um, and this analysis um, 
But at this time, they noticed this decline in size at age. And so they thought that when they published this one, they thought we have to redo this because size at age is changing and we're concerned about this. So Anna Parma in 1999 updated that previous analysis with a little bit more data and concluded that there are small gains in the yield per recruit to be made under a smaller minimum size limit. But the uh, spawning biomass per recruit also declined. And so that was sort of an offset of that. It put more risk to the stock. And so they concluded a 32 inch size limit was still up. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Can you go back one? Yeah, I, I think I understand that a lot. What is the Z? What are the contours? The Z dimension? It yeah. is the contours are um, relative to maximum yield. So the, the peak of that plot would be um, one. No, I'm guessing. It's been a while since I've reviewed this. Yeah, I'm just to try to wrap my head around F is like 0.1 and the limit's 120 centimeters. You're only getting half the yield you do compared to max. So it seems. Right. Yeah, yeah because. You're going to end up with giant fish. Yeah, giant catch fish. Catch a few giant fish. But mortality rate was 0.2, assumed to be about 0.2. So a lot of fish are dying by the time you get that large. And you're probably not catching anything, right? Um, yeah. That, I mean, yeah. the whole male thing has a big right. wrinkle in this. The lower the size limit, the more males you're going to catch. The higher the size limit, the more you focus on the female. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like it should be much lower than 0.5. What's that? Uh, that bottom right corner. I'm surprised the, the contours aren't steep. Oh. Yeah, it could, it could be their assumptions at that time, especially the assumptions about growth. I think they used like a linear growth. They only went up to probably a two. Mm -hmm. So linear growth is really not what happens. Yeah. Yeah. They leave them in the water, they just keep getting bigger forever. Right. Even though they start to die, they, they get giant eventually. Yeah. But just shouldn't be very many of them because of natural mortality. Anyways, that surprises me. Yeah. Oh, and, and it, it, it's really interesting. Um, and also, these analyses at that time were based on very small areas where they had data from. So a lot of times, uh, in, put some cash in here. A lot of times, it'll be using data from Goose Island. So it's a really small, and then they do a number of different spots along the coast. So, um, and as you'll see, as we go through the history, we keep expanding that scope and expanding a lot of the scope. Um, real quick, before yeah. you move off that. Um, so if that's... So is that also saying basically you're kind of at the largest size limit you'd want? Because you could go back to the left to smaller size limits and stay pretty close yep. to this spot. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and that yield seems to start dropping pretty quickly as you go to a, to a higher size limit. Is there any effect of being caught on growth rates? You know, the work that I'm familiar with, the, the, there was a time I got to leave when they did some work and they said, yes, growth is, dependent, is density dependent, but we haven't. I don't know what I mean is, is if you get caught and thrown back. Oh, right, right, right. And you've been invoked. Is there any change? Gene Sullivan did that work? Or, yeah, I think there's been some work, but we haven't seen huge effects. So that was a perfect, perfect analogy with uh, rock lobsters in, in South Africa, mm. where uh, females are bigger. There's a lot of mortality if you throw them back overboard. Yeah. Um, but also, when you catch them, they typically shed a couple of legs or whatever. Oh. And then um, and then when they molt, instead of getting bigger, they get smaller because then they lose, they've lost some of their energy and they have to like, they're not, they're not as big as they would be. Yeah. And so they, so then they never reach the minimum length. Yeah. You catch them over and over again. Look at it. Fish with prior hook injuries don't, don't fall below the growth curve. They seem to be doing Yeah. Well. So, so you either survive yeah. or they die. Yeah. And if they survive, they seem to grow just fine. Yeah. yeah. Even the ones they use that to reduce the, the length, minimum length for oh, wow. losses, because it would reduce the overall mortality. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, you know, we are looking one project the IPHC has that a student might be interested in is prior hooking injuries. We have a huge database of prior hooking injuries. Um, you know, from just little marks on their cheek to the whole cheek and jaw torn out. These fish survive, they still grow, but that might be an interesting thing to look at is like. Are some of these fish growth rate affected or not? There's a ton of work going on in IPC right now on growth rates too. I think Joseph, did they just publish the paper on the, the genetics and growth rate? Or are they publishing that one soon? So yeah. Um that that it looked at the genetic the genes that you know are, are used for growth and, and all sorts of fun stuff. So more to come soon on growth.
Okay, so uh, Parma in 1999 still found the 32 inch minimum size limit was optimal, even with the declining size of the age. And then Juan Valero and Steve Hare did uh, the, what, what is listed as a handout at an annual meeting, which is not easy to find, um, which is why I have the pictures here, sorry. But um, they did a study and they started expanding on this using uh, more of the coast. They used a migratory model of the core area of halibut. Um, and they found that there was a slight positive effect again with, with reductions in the minimum size limit. Um, with, um, if you took away the size limit or really reduced the size limit, that they actually found there'd be quite a decrease, big decrease in yield. So they suggested uh, maintaining that size limit, or they could lower it slightly. Um, and they thought it was precautionary to retain the minimum size limit. There were still a lot of unknowns, um, and they felt that there was a risk to the spawning biomass if the minimum size limit was eliminated. And this was under the management at that time as well. Okay, so now, let's see, that was 2012. <clears throat> Three years later is 2015. Steve Martel, Bruce Lehman, Ian Stewart, and James Sullivan uh, took a look at this with equilibrium models again, and they compared the 32 inch to a 30 inch minimum size limit. Um, and some here are some plots where the blue is the 30 inch size limit and the red is the 32 inch size limit. And that top middle one, the yield one, you can see with the 30 inch size limit, there's a slight increase in maximum yield. Um, and that would actually occur at a smaller fishing uh, mortality rate as well, which is the horizontal axis. They, um, they noted in here that there might be a lower price for U32 halibut. And so it not, might not all be about yield here. Sure, we can increase the yield, but if we're catching more fish under 32 inches, then the processors aren't going to pay as much as an over 32 inch fish what is the value of the fishery? So they started coming down that road of thinking about what is the benefit of size limits to the value of the fishery? And they, are, they also thought about the importance of selectivity, DMRs and bycatch, um, which some of the other studies we've already looked at and investigated as well. Okay, another three years later, <laughs> 2018, might start to see a pattern here is, um, <clears throat> Uh, Ian Stewart and myself did an analysis looking at size limits. Uh, this was a request from the commission to do this. Um, so, and this was a really good paper because we really started thinking about all the, the different components of mortality here and they're trying to explain that to people and have people understand. And so this figure over here is you have all those retained or landed fish over 32 inches, they come to the dock, they're landed, you have really good accounting for that, and that's why it has a horizontal line at the top. You really know what that weight was. But then you have a bunch of discarded fish that are observed through an observer program or reported in log books, or you make some uh, estimate of what those dead fish are, and there's some uncertainty in that as well, and that's why this is a triangle. And you add those two together, and you have other sources of mortality, uh, fishing mortality, and then you have a total mortality or catch on the Ian used catch in this plot. <laughs> that is, because it includes everything that was oh, yeah, you're right. retained or not. Yes, yes, so that's catch. We, we go around what all the <laughs> definitions of these things are. But anyway, so the total is subject to a lot of uncertainty because we don't see what some of that discard is. And so we're trying to get that point across, that there's this uncertainty out there in our data in what, how the fishing is affecting the stock of Pacific halibut. So in this analysis, it really looked at short-term sort of immediate outcomes. What happens if we manage this way today and presented this to you tomorrow um, with a new size limit? So they used the stock assessment. Um, we used the, um, uh, the management procedure using spawning potential ratio. So you're sort of keeping that effect on the spawning biomass consistent. So you either keep the size limit or remove the size limit and then rerun to uh, figure out to maintain that SPR spawning potential ratio, what would the removal be to maintain that spawning balance? Um, we looked at some scenarios with selectivity and then really considered the amount of discard mortality, not only the rates, but how much discard mortality would there be? And at 
this time was right when we were getting rid of the word wastage. That's what they used to call discard mortality in the commercial fisheries, is wastage. And we just felt, it, a lot of people felt that this wasn't a good word. Um, it, it had negative connotations, but that was what the word was used back then. So we really wanted to, to bring that out. Um, what the findings of this are, and they're summarized in these plots over here as well, is there's just over a 4% gain in retained catch, which you can see on the top plots. Um, so no status quo um, compared to no size limit. It's about plus 4% in the blue bar up top. And then the other, just the scenarios with different targeting. But in the bottom, we, we started um, letting or started calculating what percentage of U32 fish would be in these landings because there was this potential price difference. Um, and down on the bottom there, you can see without a size limit, that went to 77% of the catch would be O32. Um, and then 25% uh, would be U32. So that's quite a bit of small fish that the markets aren't used to and the processors are not used to. We also thought about fishery, fishing efficiency. So instead of a boat going out, and in some areas, I think one in every third fish is undersized because uh, there's fish in, in you know, areas with small fish, that fishing efficiency without a size limit, they'd be just keeping all the fish and might have to make fewer trips. So really we're thinking about what is fishery value? It may be more with increase in yield, but it could also be less. Um, and it depends on the price that you get for a fish under 32 ounces. And we also concluded that under an SPR-based management procedure, that the minimum size limit's not really providing protection to the spotted biomass, um, that a proper management procedure would help to, to protect that spotted biomass. 21 minus 18, that's another three years. Um, so three years later, they request a size limit analysis again. Um, 2024 now. So again, Ian Stewart, myself, and now Basha Hutnixak, uh, uh, economist and uh, head of our uh, policy at IPHC, did an analysis using very similar methods, using the stock assessment, but an updated stock assessment, and really went through the history in this one. And there's a, um, a document associated with this from an annual meeting that's really interesting to read. But we started thinking, we started really thinking about this from perspectives of male versus females, discard mortality, um, so describing the data. But again, it was a short-term analysis. Um, we looked at minimum size limit, but we also looked at a maximum size limit. Can't keep anything over 60 inches. Um, Avoiding the targeting, and then we considered spatial considerations in this analysis too. And so these plots are different regulatory areas showing female and red and male um, age distributions from the from the landings. That's sublegal oh, only. Yeah, no, that's sublegal only, right? And that's from the bits, right? That's from our set line survey. So these are age distributions of the sublegals under 32 inches from our fishery independent set line survey. And what you can see is that there are some old males that are under 32 inches. I mean, out in 3A, there's some that are over 20 years old. Um, really fascinating. So big difference there. Um, these old males swimming around, that's the, you can't, can't keep me. <laughs> So this was a plot that was um, created to help understand the increases in yield, but the change in the ratio of U32 to O32. And so we have the current minimum size limit on the left, and that's 100% of the relative yield because everything's relative to that one on the left. As you take, uh, remove the size limit in the middle, no size limit, you see there's about a 7% increase in yield. Conditions in the stock assessment are slightly different. And that there is about, what was it? It's about 90% was O32, I think 88% or something was O32 fish. Um, oh, relative, yeah, to the yield tension. Yeah, just in the, when it says 30% U32, does that mean 30% increase or 30% of? That was increasing the amount of U or, or so no. it was a 30% increase in the catch of U32s. 
done through selectivity because we wanted to see if they shifted to or away from mm -hmm. sublegal fish, what would be the effect on the yield? Like they're striking a target. Right. A target yeah. or avoid. Yeah. 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 So, so this is targeting and the left is avoiding. And what you can see is that it doesn't really change the overall yield a whole lot, but it does change the proportion of U32 to O32 in the in the um, in the uh, in the land use. And is this still conditioned on the 46% SPR? This one 43 at this time or whatever. Yeah, this one was conditioned on SPR, but I think at this time it was 43% SPR instead of 46. Yep. Which also explains the difference between four percent and seven percent increase in the yield. And then what's interesting is the maximum size limit had no change in the relative yield. Um, it was it was a wash, but there's other considerations which I'll touch on after this. So we also, because now this was a coastwide assessment, we're really thinking throughout the entire convention area at this time. Um, talking with stakeholders, they said, yeah, but I all I catch are, are small fish right around 32 inches, or I, you know, one in every third fish is a small fish. And others are, you know, 2C down off Sitka. It's like, not every fish is big. You know, we never worry about small fish. So there's real spatial differences. And so we presented a table with percent U32 in the landings. And you can see something like 2C is like 9%, but some areas are almost 30%. And so it was a real big difference depending where a stakeholder had quota, whether or not a size, how much a size limit would affect them if they have to stay within a regulatory area. But um, coastwide, it was about 18% um, of the landings would be under 32 uh, inch fish, and with a 7% gain in yield. So we started thinking, okay, well, what about this value to the fishery? And we came up with this concept called critical price ratio, which is what fraction of the O32 price is needed for U32s for the fishery to come out even. So we're reducing the amount of O32 fish, we're increasing the amount of U32 fish, which slightly increases the yield as well, but what do you have to get paid for U32 fish to have an equal value fishery with or without the size limit? And what we found coastwide is that a U32 fish had to be 63% the price of an O32 fish for there to be equal value in the fishery. But that again was dependent on regulatory area because of the amount of fish caught in each area. Um, so this was a lot of discussion that we had with stakeholders and the commission um, and realizing that this is, uh, there's a lot of decision points here, including, um, you know, this is just a simple calculation of the price, but we didn't factor in things like maybe they have to make fewer trips because they can fill up the boat faster because um, they're not throwing fish overboard. Um, so there might be improved efficiency. Um, and so a harvester might actually like to remove the size limit. And if there was a carbon market. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be worth money. Yeah. Yeah, Jim. Sorry, on, on that, it, so people, when you say U32, what, what's the effective size range of U32? Presumably it doesn't go down to 10 cents. Right. So, so yeah, that, I should have, yeah, that would have been a good slide to put in as selectivity. The, the commercial fishery rarely catches fish less than 26 inches. Um, and um, you'll see some results coming up that that actually reflect that. They do catch a couple, a, a few, but of course, then that's dependent on the state of the size of age as well. I mean, if those fish are growing fast, they're, they're just gonna go through those before they're encountered by a lot of these fisheries, they'll be over 26, 30. But the 26 inches related to the hook size mostly, or? Yeah, the hook size and where they're fishing. I mean, yeah, they, the high halibut move, they have ontogenetic movement throughout their lifetime. So um, they they know spots to catch legal halibut for sure. So we discussed a lot of different considerations in this study. This was 2021, um, including the economic value, how, what's the logistics of implementing size limits. Um, there was talk about maybe we could do this in certain areas and not other areas, and that got pretty logistical. <laughs> um, 
the the effects on size at age you know we hypothesized about that although a lot of that's really unknown so i showed you spatial effects and differences finding biomass recruitment but what we found really interesting was public perception and this is where we started talking about the total amount of discard mortality occurring in the commercial fishery right now it's a little less than one million pounds suffer mortality after being released in the commercial directed fishery so people are like well that seems like maybe it's wasted fish so we wanted to present this and um see how that went and then we thought you know what we have an mse now or it's being developed why don't we use an mse to um test size limits and look at it not only in the short term but the long term as well so there's a nice little table summarizing this study um, here, I know in, in this is a lot of different considerations we had. So, for example, fishery yield, 7% increase, no change with the max size limit, um, some, some things about value, discard mortality was increased by 0.8 million pounds of fish that'd be less uh, discarded at sea and not utilized. Um, but with a maximum size limit, that discard mortality would increase by 0.12. And um, and then fishery efficiency and other things like that. So um, <clears throat> we didn't do another one this year, which would be three years later. Instead, we did one last year. So the commission jumped the gun on us and really wanted us to get going, maybe because we were suggesting using the MSE there. And so what we did is we investigated three size limits, uh, no size limit, a 26 inch and a 32 inch size limit using uh, closed loop simulations in the MSE framework that's been developed at IPHC. A couple of interesting things there I won't go into, um, MSE in particular, but one is integrating over uncertainty of size at age, because we're projecting out long-term, say 100 years, but we're gonna integrate over all the possibilities of size at age. So we're gonna get a good look at what are the, what are the possibilities and outcomes to create these distributions, um, as well as selectivity and recruitment, uh, we have performance metrics that we can report now that and stakeholders have been involved in that process. Um, and then we further examine the economics. So really the goal was to examine long-term effects of the different <laughs> size limits um, in relation to the objectives we had defined at IPHC. Alan? Yep. Sorry to interrupt again. No um, worries. That's an interesting point about projecting the uncertainty in the way to age. So how did you actually do that? Because it's like you guys do empirical weighted age. Yeah, so we basically used a pretty simple random, well, it's a it's a random walk, and we did a, um, a autoregressive, an AR1 look at it to, to parameterize the random walk. So it's, I think the change in weighted age is dependent on the previous two years, and it just random walks, but up down there, because otherwise it would walk into some pretty weird spaces. So it's a really simple approach, but when we looked at the simulations, it mimics this very short period of 100 years that we've observed just to figure out that size of age is over. So we're just, um, yeah, we're trying to do that. The nice thing is after projecting about 60 years or whatever, it integrates nicely over the range of potential size of age, but it's not changing real suddenly. And that's the key here. Size of age doesn't change real quickly but it can have trends in architecture. Um, yeah, so this is how we're reporting performance metrics, and each of these is related to a different objective defined by the commission. We have long-term ones like related to relative spawning biomass at the top. And what you can see is with different size limits as columns, that the relative spawning biomass did not change a whole lot. And this is again an SPR based method. So um, it's trying to maintain that spawning potential ratio or spawning mortalities that would maintain that spawning potential ratio. Um, when um, you look at short term is four to 14 years, and that's just what the commission wanted to see. What are the performance metrics for four to 14 years in the future? And we can report it for long term as well, but. The median average TCY, which is the mortality limit for basically the, all the different fisheries, you can think of it that way. Um, the median average TCY increased as you remove the size limit from 58.3 to 60.5, but you see most of that gain occurred just going to 26 inches. 
So there's little gain going from 26 to zero. And then we have AAV, which is average um, annual variation in the TCY. And that was pretty consistent, although it declined maybe slightly when you remove the minimum size. The key here is that most of the gains in yield occur going to 26 inches. Another interesting result now that we have a projection is we can plot what is the difference in TCUI without a size limit and over time. And we can see that we have some real, we have starting conditions at the beginning of these simulations. Uh, low size at age, we had a period of low recruitment and other things like that. And what we found is given those starting conditions is that there was quite a large potential increase in the TCUI or the mortality limit, um, the quota, if um, a size limit was removed. But once you start integrating over recruitment regimes, changes in size at age, different selectivity patterns, you know, it, it always remained as a slight increase above current with the size limit. So it was always a potential gain removing the size limit. And it was about 75% of the time you would expect those limits to increase. So we started looking at time dependent things. I'm going a little bit fast now. I realize people probably want to get out. Um, but we, we also looked at the proportion of U32 in the landing. So now focusing the 32 inch size limits on the right, just to confuse you. Um, and that's the status quo. And then without the size limit, no XL, you see there's a 5% gain but a 7% loss in the O32s, the percentage of O32s that you pull. So you're, you're, you have more U32s um, in the yield and you actually lose some O32s. So related to yield, um, uh, which occurs lowering to 26, there's some significant gains in, in recent years, but those can get washed out pretty quick depending on conditions. Um, and the amount of U32 halibut reduced at a higher rate than the U32s, uh, that, and the total yield has increased. So the question was, does this really yield, does this change in yield lead to an improved fishery? Um, and as mentioned earlier, Pacific halibut are often given a higher price as, as larger size categories. Um, and we actually had, fortunately at this time, the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey was keeping all their under 32 inch fish that were dressed or sampled for OSIP or whatever, um, and selling those to the processors. And the processors were giving them a price about 88% of the O32 price. So we had a small amount of data to tell us what the, what the price of these U32s might be. So we were concerned about a decrease in the value of the fishery. And we came up with the, the name equal value price ratio, which is basically the same thing as really that critical price ratio. What would result in an equal value to the fishery? And I have to have an equation. This is a quantitative seminar, so I have this one. Um, here we go. I'll explain it thoroughly for you. <laughs> we have L is landings, and um, O32 is landings of O32 fish, and then the second number is the, the size limit. So that's a 32 inch size limit. And then so L of O32, no size limit. So that's the difference between the landings of O32 fish with and without the size limit. And then the, the um, denominator is just landings of U32 with the new size limit. So say removing a size limit. And so what you can think about is say you remove the size limit and the O32 landings don't change at all, but you get a whole bunch of more U32 fish, then the numerator is zero and you get a value of zero. And so you don't actually need the U32 fish to be anything, to be, have any value to maintain the value of the fishery. But if um, the, let's see, the O32, let's say that, that you actually increase the amount of O32 fish for some reason when you have no size limit, then you can get a value greater than one. And so we created this plot to help explain what the value means as percentage on the left. And so if the EVPR is less than zero, that's when it doesn't matter what the value of the U32 is, they're all for free. You, you, the value of the fishery remains the same or will increase. 
between zero and 100 is where you need to consider the fraction of a price. And then greater than 100 is where you actually have to get more for a U32 fish for the value of the fishery. So here's some results changing the size limit. There's a lot of variability in these, but in general, it was about, you would need those U32 fish to be about 50% the price of an O32 fish. But there's a lot of variability in this. And um, looking over the long term now is this is really sensitive to starting conditions and the conditions of the stock as well. So starting now, we had um, really unique conditions where uh, you wouldn't lose a lot of the O32 catch, I guess. And, and I'm, I'm struggling to remember exactly why this all occurred. But the key outcome on this is it really depends on the stock conditions. On, on what would make for an equal value fishery. But over the long term, that's about a 50% price. So we presented all that to the commissioners and even processors, and they said, thank you very much. Um, but we had some other outcomes that we presented as well. Um, the percent increase in the TCOI was about four to six with a higher fishing intensity. So if we fished harder, you'd get a more gain in yield. Um, when the size limit was gone, um, but targeting um, smaller or larger fish reduced gains um, as you target larger fish, but you still had gains. But here, this last bullet point was really important. Again, it's a 78% decrease in the directed commercial discard mortality. So that's going from almost a million pounds to just about you know a fifth of that um, when removing the size limit. That's a lot less uh, fish being thrown overboard to that. So that's the last size limit that we had um, analysis. It's 2023. We're not sure. We, did have, we have a meeting next week. The commissioners could want another size limit analysis. Maybe we're going to a two-year period now. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I just want to leave you with a few parting thoughts on this in that lowering the size limit would likely increase the total yield, but that total yield consists of smaller fish, which might be worth less. And so you have to really think about that. What is the value of the fishery? We're working on improved methods to do that. And that's why we brought BASHA into the analysis as well. Um, and there are other considerations here, changes in selectivity. What is the discard mortality rate? How's that uncertainty? That's an uncertainty that wasn't incorporated in here. Um, and then the uncertainty in what is actually realized in the outcome, say you put this into management and then 10 years down the road, this is what actually happens. We're not certain about that. And, um, and changing from the status quo. So the, the last bullet point there is really what led the commissioners last year to not change the size. Because processors were concerned. It, it were like, you can increase the yield, you can reduce discard mortality. And everybody says, I just don't know what's gonna happen. I just don't know if the processors are even going to buy these fish. You know, the processors are like, we don't know what's going to happen if you flood us with a ton of small fish. That competes with yellowfin sole. That competes with all these smaller sole fish. So they, they don't, we don't know if we have markets for that. So there was a lot of uncertainty there. And at that, that time, they felt we're not going to move away from the status quo. So last one is... The size limit analysis is like Groundhog Day. Originally, <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to present Groundhog Day. See you know, week. I challenge no one to come up with a good Groundhog Day analogy until the presentation on February 2nd, which is the plug for Noble Hendrix. He'll be uh, taking my slot on February 2nd. So make sure you show up for that and see probably lots of equations. <laughs> so um, there's my email. Happy to chat with anybody, both Ian Stewart and I. And uh, thanks for your attention today. Yep, go ahead. What, what's the cost of having? I mean, I guess two things. The 26 inch limit doesn't seem very different at all from no size limit because of the selectivity yep. kind of problem. I guess, what's, did, you, did you consider, and I probably should know this. The cost of actually having a size limit management wise, like who polices it and where does that happen? 
Yeah, that's where we went. We started going down that road and I think of that 2018 analysis and showing them that, hey, there's a huge uncertainty in how many fish are, being, are dying because of fishing. If we remove the size limit, all of a sudden we have much better data. And so we, we tried that, that argument as well. Um, but but yeah, so it, um, it's been certainly a thought. We, we haven't had a whole lot of discussion about that. But that's another one of those other considerations that would be really important. And uh, if you have any good ideas how to really... How does policing uh, happen now? I mean, who... Um, it's through the observer program. Um, yeah, observers get that. But um, how do you determine the amount of discards? So it depends on the area. There's some Canadian waters, there's comprehensive coverage and logbook and video recording. In Alaska, there's partial observer coverage. And we use encounter rates on the survey as a proxy for the unobserved parts of the fishery. Does that go to law enforcement in each country? Yeah, uh, it's it's enforced by both domestic law enforcement. Well, it, it's enforced by both state agencies as well as NOAA enforcement and the Coast Guard. So all three groups can enforce it. So if a boat has an exercise fish on, they can get ticketed by pretty much anybody that boards them. So the reverse of that, though, is a little gray because if they discard 33 inch fish it's hard to prove even with video monitoring it's virtually impossible to say whether that fish really was under 32 inches and i think that part of the discussion the last time around was if there were 100 percent monitoring of this fishery in all places there might be a greater appetite for getting rid of the size limit but because it seemed like it might be differentially um participated in <laughs> that there was a little bit more reluctance i think to remove the size of that, even though we don't have any guarantee now that it's will be fully participated yeah. in, other than that's undersized, it can't come up. Yeah. I mean, one of the things you don't talk about is the risk, the risk of dropping below a certain threshold of biomass. And you know, usually you have uh, size limits to reduce the risk of basically to create a uh, a refuge for fish. Yeah. So if you make a mistake and what you think the assessment is, we don't catch them all. So, so, so how does that differ in your MSC? So that came in a little bit in that performance metric table. Um, and that is that, that was something new and so that we were presenting here. You know, what's the probability that um, the relative spawning biomass was less than 36%? And 36% is considered a proxy for um, so any Y or something like that. So um, the, the the thing though with Pacific halibut is we're not harvesting at levels that bring it that have a very high risk to going to really low levels, um, low relative spawning biomass levels and risk to uh, the stock compared to an unfished size. We are currently at the lowest spawning biomass, absolute spawning biomass level seen last thirty or so years. Um, <clears throat> And so there's that risk to going to fewer biomass, less biomass of fish, but relative to what it would be on the fish, it's um, it maintains. And that's we're not fishing at very high fishing intensity with an FPR of 43 percent. MSY is probably an FPR of 30 percent, and ME by the figures by the percent. So we're still way above those levels. So we really haven't had those conversations about risk. Spawning dominance and uh, thank you. Parking <laughs> and um, yeah, and so it it's something that we we present this stuff to the commissioners, but the risks are always as well. And yeah. the common misperception of the size limit that is there to protect the spawning biomass. It about half the catch is immature anyway. Well, that so was it's... my question: was how does the minimum uh, size limit compare to the maturity at size, and what were your kind of assumptions about, um, like obviously growth is so plastic in the fish and probably dependent on environment conditions, and I'm sure maturity at size or age is probably similarly changing through time and space. Um, so when you're looking at SDR, are you kind of taking that into consideration, or does it really not? So you are saying you are ca catching a lot of immatures, or yeah. not catching? <laughs> Yeah, we um, our estimate of maturity fifty percent mature about age eleven point six. Um, I forget what that translates to in length, but um, at this point, and 
But you know, they're the fishery is focused on what pages eight to sixteen to sixteen, eight to sixteen is what the fishery really catches more. So and so they are catching a large number of immature fish, immature fish. Um relative to changes in maturity over time, we just started collecting new maturity data and are looking at that over time and what the um have there been changes? Some older studies, we haven't done a maturity study in quite a while, I can see. Um, but some of the older studies look at maturity at age versus maturity of length, and we're concerned about changes in the size of age. We found that maturity of age was actually consistent with all the data they had, and you know, but size of age was changing crazily. So maturity of length was changing a lot, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so we have new data that are actually being analyzed right now, um, and we're getting more data, and this is all histological data now too. Um, from, we'll have data from two different years, from more recent years, and then we'll try to compare that to the past and see if, there, if that holds true, that maturity at age is more constant, or if there have been changes with the recent, you know, with this decline in size of age that we've seen in the last 30 years. So it's something we're thinking about, but at these fishing mortality levels, the, the risk to the spawning bottom of the is kind of high. And, and, and that was, we did, in fact, when I write up this paper, I did some more runs at higher fishing intensive levels because I want to start pushing it and seeing when do these concerns become important. In terms of like the potential value of biomass under 26, uh, under 26 inches, do we know, or do we have any idea what the kind of lower limit for the processors would be like obviously you would know until you build the market with those fish but like from your hook and line survey where you can land or the fiss survey where you can land undersized stuff is there a lower limit that they're like we don't want anything below x amount of inches or like a it's fine like inches. Inches. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is 32 inches. From things we've heard, you know, the, the survey is like, hey, we're, we're killing these fish because we're, we have to sample it for no and And so we're just throwing dead fish overboard, you know, and let's um, bring it in and sell them. Processors originally were like, yeah, we'll give it a try. And, you know, we had these discussions at the last annual meeting, and I look forward to having more discussions at this annual meeting. Does anything change? And they were just really concerned about something new under 32 inches in the market. Um, I, I think, you, you know, the market for halibut is probably a little different right now than it was even 10 years ago, but there's a lot of competition out there for small fillets. How do they market these restaurants when they serve halibut? They want this nice thick fillet that's exactly that size, five ounces or whatever. So a lot of processors are saying, you know, we're buying the fish from your survey, these under 32s from your survey, just because. And I think sometimes they hand off the fish for free. They don't even process them or, you know, things like that. So they said, if we if we had to buy a whole lot of these under 32 inch fish, I don't know what we would do with them. And in fact, I received a call from a friend of mine that works in a processor clinic on a Saturday and once he goes, hey, the boat just delivered a bunch of fish under 32 inches. Like, is this right? And I go, yeah, that's what our survey is doing. He goes, they bought these. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, yeah, okay. Um, I'll leave it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which one's great. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's just the more learning yeah. duck and sass. Just, uh, <laughs> yeah. Send an email around. <laughs> you know, on the third floor, it's just a advantage to getting the free <laughs> but, um, But, yeah, and so, um, there's a lot of concern about just the marketing and some some processes were saying, I don't even think we paid 50% of the price if we got the other. So yeah, so it, it, there was a lot of, you know, just concern about those uncertainties. But we don't know what will happen in 10 years. Maybe in 10 years they could develop markets, but right now they don't. they just call it like diet halibut or something? <laughs> yeah, halibut <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Is there any difference in like meat quality in the smaller fish? Um, you talk to a processor or someone marketing, no. Um, you talk to a fisherman, and I think some people believe there is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was when I ate the trolley sole, actually, when I ate the California halibut, I like the smaller ones because they're a perfect size fillet. Yeah, get more parasites or something. 
Yeah, the recovery rate does go down a little bit. But so the little fish have a slightly lower recovery rate because their their head is a larger proportion of their body. So the processors do lose a little bit of total pound to recovered product. Okay, we have a few questions online. Sorry, I didn't mean to um, ignore you all. We're having fun in here. Dan Goffel says, given the importance of DMR on results of YCR, was the 16% value based on every analysis? Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, so the, the DMR, we did some work recently for long lines. Um, and we did a recreational uh, fishing study looking at DMRs as well using um, the satellite tags, pop-up satellite tags that had the um, a sense, what's it, the knockdown sensor? Accelerometer. Accelerometer, moving. Accelerometer yeah. So I was telling if the fish was moving. And, um, and, and so we looked at after these fish were caught, released them, and saw if they, they died, and we found the results to be very consistent with previous research, and thus felt the 16% was still a reasonable value. Um, and, um, but you're right, Dan, in that we haven't done that study in the presence of large predators like whales. Um, and I don't think they want to pee the $2,000 satellite tag to a whale is part of the problem. There may be some permits required to put a whale on just a satellite tag. But I have heard um, that if these satellite tags have temperature gauges on, you can tell when they're just um, <laughs> But that, 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 that's a really good point, and it's an uncertainty that we have not included in this analysis. And looking back in the history, it might be something we want to consider in the future. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and Basha uh, mentioned that there would be the cost related to enforcing retention requirement. So that's another one of the costs of having a size permit. And Don Gunderson, thanks for joining. What does the recreational fishing community think of changing the size limit? The recreational fishing community, I think, was pretty interested in changing the maximum size limit because it would allow more bigger fish for the recreational fishing. But you know, it starts competing with it when you reduce the size limit. But again, the commercial fishery is not catching many fish under 26 inches. So um, yeah, th there was definitely a concern from recreation fishery. And oh yeah, and Emily says alley bites. I like that one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Emily. That's awesome. I have a question right. related yeah. to Don's question. Um, how? What's the commercial perception of the fishermen? Like, are they actually <laughs> flexible enough to avoid or focus on any of their tips? They're pretty good. It depends on the area again. Like the fishermen in 2C is like the rear of the sea. It's a small portion of our catch. It's not a problem. And they're so good when they're coming up, just pop them off and they go right back in the water. And that's why they survive as well. But someone in, um, you know, about Kodiak or, you know, out in there, what's our area 3B, they might be popping off one out of every three fish and releasing it in the water. But, you know, I didn't hear much. It, it was sort of agnostic on the on the support or not for size limits from fishermen. A lot of them are like, we do what we do and we're good at it. We can catch, we go know where the large fish are and we're going to catch them. And sometimes we have to go to the chicken spots, they call them, the small fish. So, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see when the next size limit analysis <laughs> drops up. We got maybe a couple of years. Yeah, a few more years. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Oh, yeah, Josh. Is there any interest in extending the assessment for, I guess, the operating model of the NSC to include distinct spatial components and to stop being a standard post wide model? Because it seems like there's quite a bit. <clears throat> Difference spatially or what you're what changing the discard sizes do? Yeah, so the the MSC operating model is a four region model, um, and we model movement between those regions with lots of uncertainty. Um, the stock assessment is a post wide model, and we if we investigated it. I think right when I came to ITHC is when Ian tried to put together an area specific model, did a lot of work on it, and we went to review with our scientific review board. And it just didn't gel. You know, it didn't come together as a real tactical model useful for decision making. And the SRB says, you know, yeah, it's just the coastwide model is performing fine for decision making, 
this spatial model is a much better research model. That's the route we've gone. So in the future, we'll do more size limits using the regional model and start really looking at this regional differences. So is, is the Coast Guard catch allowance that's decided on? Is that then apportioned to different regions via some metric, or is it just a Coast Wide catch and then once it's closed, then you close that? Yeah, the process is it's a Coast Wide catch and then that's distributed to each um, of our regulatory areas and then the quota counts and, and then it's further distributed within a regulatory area by the domestic agencies to recreational directive. And then within each of those sectors is where the quota holds. So each sector is responsible for the quota, the fishery quota system on state beach. What's the what's the mechanism by which you set the apportionment of it? Why not the, the... <laughs> exchanges every year it, it's a negotiation process really we've been working with the mse to have a more formulaic approach to distribution and that's proven very challenging um you know there's eight different regulatory areas to think about and they right now they want to maintain that flexibility of the negotiation so now we're trying to develop how do we as science feed into that negotiation process well, thanks everybody. Um, you wanna, yeah, I'm always available. Email me um, with any questions, or if you just want to come over to IPHD and check it out anytime, we'd love to have you over there and walk the halls with history. Yeah, cool. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for staying late. Welcome um, to Quantsan next week. We have a talk by the decision making with the certainty lab from the Department of Science. Um, and they'll be talking about communicating uncertainty information to non expert non fish stuff. And Ian and I will be doing that all next week. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Yeah.